You know, fathers, it's been, uh, fathers, he's been working in my own heart, and uh, he's been just probing and prodding at me and asking me to share. You know, for the past few months, I felt it welling up in me, and not just at a, a word for you guys, but just of what he's been doing in my own heart and life. And um, clearly, I'm not going to make it through this without crying, but... You know, so the opportunity came, and I had to say yes, even though this is not me. I don't, I don't like to stand up in front, but, you know, when Father tells you to do something, you do it or you end up in a fish, you know, and that's not what I want. So, um, so this morning is going to be a little bit about my testimony, all the way back from getting born again to just the real last four years of just crushing and just something that... Um, that's been pressed in my heart the last few months and just the power of personal relationship, you know, the power that comes from being on your knees and being touched by the Lord. So, man, I'm already about to cry. Thank you. All right, hallelujah. So I guess I'll, I'll start back when... Um, I'm going to start out back being 14 years old and the Lord, the Lord reaching down and touching me. Um, I had, you know, I guess I should start before that. I don't really remember a time not being in church, not being around it. Um, Dad was a wild man back when he was younger, but he got born again when I was three. So I never experienced any of that. All I experienced was going to church, going to parking lot, loading up stuff in the Trans Am, putting the speaker out, dad preaching, um, going to a tent revival. So I always was around the Lord and seeing him move. And, um, and I was always, you know, excited about it, but I never experienced it when I was, when I was younger. went on and uh, continued to go to church and got excited. I loved hearing the stories. You loved hearing about Jesus. But um, didn't have that encounter myself and ended up getting in a little bit of trouble, as young boys do, teenagers coming in, and, you know, flesh was out of control. Had a little, uh, what I call, come-to-Jesus meeting by the leadership at the time. And they asked me flat out, they said, hey, do you, do you, do you even want to serve the Lord? You know, and um, do you know if you're born again? And that was an interesting question because that's something I battled was knowing that I was born again. I'd been around church, had experienced it, had seen the power all over. But when I went to bed at night, I was always asking myself, am I, am I, if the Lord came back tonight, am I really going? And there was always that nervousness, that hesitation. And, uh, and I thought, well, I really hope so. I'm, I'm, I'm here, I'm going to church. I do love the Lord, I, you know, I think, I'm, I think I'm going to, but I didn't have that solid, that confidence knowing. So when he told me in that meeting, the leadership said, hey, do you, I said, yes. You know, I want to I wanna go to sleep at night, and I want to know that I know the Lord, and then I'm going to see him. So he looked at me, and I still remember sitting across the room, I remember the t-shirt he was wearing, and he said, I tell you what, he said, you're going to go now, and you know, you're going to go through a program, but you grab a hold of them, and you don't let go until you're, you know, just like Jacob said, I'm not going to let you go until I'm blessed. And at that time, I didn't really even know what that, what that meant, you know, not to let go until I was blessed, but I knew that there was, uh, there was some motivation in there. There was obviously someone that wanted to be changed, and that was my heart, so... You know, a few days went by. I got dropped off in the wonderful city of Baltimore in the program that the Lord had allowed and met some people. And I had already forgotten in the first, the first two days, you know, about that Jacob story about, you know, don't let them go to your blessed. It wasn't a, a week, about a week went by and uh, someone just came up to me there. It was, I don't even think it was anyone in leadership. And they said, you don't really get it, do you? So, what do you mean? I mean, yeah, I get it. I'm going to do my time here, and uh, I'll be back. And uh, he said, you know, you don't get it. I can see it on your face. You don't get it. 
And that's the thing now, once you get it, isn't it amazing how you can tell in someone's face when they encounter Jesus? You know, the power that comes from someone that's been on their knees and they've, you know, they've, they've been touched by Jesus. So, you know, that guy spoke to my heart broke. I remember uh, just instant instant breaking and we had an interesting setup during the day we had uh because well we were in trouble and we were teenagers so they had to keep us busy somehow so you know it was a lot of cleaning working and we had about three hours three and a half hours a day of devotion time broken up you know hour in the morning after you get up eat breakfast clean do do some more work hour in the middle of the day hour in the afternoon and then normal church service and i just remember going into the uh I said, I'm going to get away from everyone, you know, because typically you find a spot to do your devotions, your sharing room with people. You might, be, you might be shacked up with someone. You know, my room had six people in it. So I knew I didn't want to be around anyone because uh, I wanted to see Jesus. So I went down to the uh, sanctuary. I remember walking. I closed the door because the door was the old uh, six-panel heavy wood door. had the creak to it when you would open it. So you knew if someone was coming in, you know, and... Uh, Closed the door, I walked back to the back, to the back seat, kneeled down on my knees, and man, I just cried like I'd never cried before. And uh, I remember praying specifically, Lord, I don't ever want to guess again. You know, I don't want to sit down and, and wonder if I'm right. I want to know that I know you. Like, I know how to do everything that everybody around here is doing, and I know the Christian life, but I want to know you. And uh, I was there for a few hours, and the uh, chair was soaking wet. And, uh, but I knew him, you know. I knew I was changed. And I told him, I said, listen, you know, it's probably selfish of me, but I said, I want an encounter. I don't want to just walk out of here and be like, well, you know, I gave my life to the Lord. I said, I'm not settling for that. I want an encounter, and I want to look back and say, October 26, 1995, Jesus touched me. And um, he did, man. I remember sitting there praying and crying out and so thankful. And uh, for a second there, I was crying and praying. It was just me in there. And I felt, I felt a hand on my back. I felt something on my back. And I didn't even want to get up because I was so caught up in it. And I had my arm tucked to the left side. And I looked down and I saw feet. I went right back to praying. I prayed for another half hour, and the Lord just touched me. I thought to myself, I stopped for a second, I said, I never hold, heard the old door open. And uh, I knew, you know, I smiled. I knew I had my encounter to look back on. I knew at that moment, no matter what the devil came to me, because he was going to come, but at that moment I had been touched by Jesus. So I, I left there, I walked out, I wasn't the same. People didn't look at me the same. People knew something had happened. People that didn't know Jesus, they were just like I was before that, looked at me and said, what happened to you? And it was just that, it was an encounter with the Lord, with me. It wasn't a teacher teaching to me. I needed that to grow. But that's not where the power came from. The power came from that touch on my knees in front of the Lord. Um, Two days went by, and just as all, I knew it was going to happen. The enemy came came against me and said, you're still the same guy. you got the same tendencies. you got the same struggles. That wasn't real. You cried. You felt good. It wasn't real. And I was sitting in a 1980-something, 15-passenger van that hardly worked, and I was in the back, and I sat by myself close to the window. You know, when, when these things happen and Father touches us, you can always remember what you were looking at out the window, where people were sitting and... Uh, I just cried out to the Lord by myself. I said, Lord, I'm really doubting it. You don't owe me an explanation because you already gave me the encounter. But I'm weak right now. I'm hurting, Lord. Can you give me some confirmation and let me know that what happened was you? And uh, the, the program I was in, there was about 35, 35 men in there. There was a few younger ones of us. So it had only been a week or two. I hadn't met everyone. I didn't know. I knew maybe a dozen people. Um, we were on our way in that bus, we were on our way to a, some type of Bible meeting at another church, you know, and yeah, it was exciting to go to hear another teaching, and uh, I was also excited, I heard they were giving out free KFC, and 
we didn't get to eat very well, so that was a good day for me. So, but I hopped off that bus, and a, a gentleman by the name of Henry, and I don't remember this guy for anything else, he hopped out of the bus. He said, hey, uh, Paul, right? And I said, yeah. He said, can I talk to you for a second? And I said, yeah. So he pulled me aside, you know, and uh, he said, man, I, I, I don't even know why, but the Lord told me to come tell you, you're doing a good job, you're, you're doing the right thing, keep it up. Never had another conversation with that guy. I left about five weeks later, never talked to him again, but it was someone that the Lord used. From then I said, that's it, Lord, I'm not asking you for confirmation again. You told me, you know, you, you've made it real, and I'm sorry I doubted you. But sometimes we're human, and we need that. And Father is faithful to reach out and touch us and give it to us. So, you know, that story, that's, that story of Jacob has been one that's been close to my heart, and uh, I'm going to read over it here in a second for one second. Genesis 32, 24 it says, And Jacob was left alone, and there wrestled a man with him until the breaketh, breaking of the day. And when he saw that he prevailed not against him, he touched the hollow of his thigh, and the hollow of Jacob's thigh was out of joint as he wrestled with him. And he said, Let me go, for the day breaketh. And he said, I will not let thee go, except thou bless me. And he said unto him, What is thy name? And he answered, Jacob. And he said, Thy name shall be called no more Jacob, but Israel. For a prince hast thou power with God and with men, and hast prevailed. And Jacob asked him, and said, Tell me, I pray thee, thy name. And he said, Wherefore is it that thou dost ask after my name? And he blessed him there. You know, and that was a story that first day that grabbed my heart, and I've gone back to it. And it's just that when we when we reach out to him, he answers us. You know, when when we're so persuaded, and we need we need to hear from Jesus and need to be touched by Jesus, he's there. You know, and one of the things that was interesting is that. Jacob wasn't really caught up in the blessing as far as the flocks, the servants, you know, the, the monetary. He, he, he wanted to be changed, you know. Up to that point, he was a deceiver. And the reason he held on was not for the flocks and for the blessing of the monetary. He held on because he wanted his name to be changed. He wanted his character to be changed, you know. And um, I really like this uh, quote that uh, I think Tozer said. When he said, the Lord cannot fully bless a man until he has first conquered him. You know, and that, that, that line kind of sums up, you know, last four years and what the Lord's been doing. But I'll go back to it. But that just, when I heard that and I read that line that Tozer said, it just kind of just stuck in my heart, you know. Um, so, let me just move around here. I went back after that, after getting, you know, touched by the Lord. I went back into what we call civilized life or back to just normal, normal life. Mom and dad picked me up. And um, people knew I was different, you know. People I hadn't seen in two months, two and a half months knew that something happened. And um, I remember getting back. One thing that stood out, of my, you know, stood out in my mind and I still remember to this day is uh, I got back and um, the compassion that was in my heart because I remember seeing other teenagers that were just like me, that were in church, but it was so dull. There was no power. They were miserable. You know, they hadn't experienced the touch of the Lord. They were sitting there walking something out that their parents had brought them into, or like me, that they excited them, that they thought they were doing, but they were powerless. You know, they didn't have that revelation, and the Lord gave me opportunity to sow into those lives and to, to make a difference and make some changes. I didn't make every right decision after that. I'm not saying that, but I'm saying at that point, I knew the Lord was with me, and, and uh, there was a special place in my heart for those people that were hurting. I had, um, when I was there, I went there with three, two of my supposed friends at the time, and they were friends of mine, mainly because we all got in trouble together. And uh, I remember asking one of the pastors, you know, one of them was still there, hey, how is, how's so-and-so doing? And uh, I remember he looked up at me with a smile and he said, well, he said, 
I would love to tell you that they're turning Baltimore upside down because the Lord's got a hold of them, but that's not the case. And he smiled and he goes, of course, I would love to say that Paul is turning Sterling upside down because the Lord's got a hold of him, but that hasn't happened yet either. And, uh, and it wasn't a, you're not doing what you need to do. It was an encouragement of, God's touched you. Let it touch other people, you know. Let the power of God that you experienced affect other people, you know. And so it did, and, you know, had a lot of good years of serving the Father, of uh, learning in my relationship, you know. And, um, but there came a time that I, that I lost it, you know. And um, that's going to bring me into my next, my next scripture verses here. And it's, a, it's another just story in the New Testament that's really dear to my heart. And um, a lot of people think of this, you know, the woman with the issue of blood about the physical healing. But for me, it was more about the spiritual touch, you know. It was about her touching Jesus and the virtue that came out. Because I think there's a lot more to that story than her issue of blood being healed. And I think that uh, it was twofold, the, whole, the, the point of the story. So let's go over to Luke eight forty-three, And it says, And a woman having an issue of blood twelve years, which had spent all her living upon physicians, neither could be healed of any. This was a lady that wanted to be free. She wanted to be changed. Twelve years of emptying every penny she had, doing anything she could imagine that, that, that someone would recommend to say would set her free, that lady was doing it, and with no success. said she came up behind Jesus and touched the border of his garment, and immediately her issue of blood was stanched. And Jesus said, Who touched me? When all denied, Peter and they that were with him said, Master, the multitude thronged thee and pressed thee, and sayest thou who touched me? There was a lot of people around. And Jesus said, Someone had touched me, for I perceive that virtue has gone out of me. And that virtue was that divine or miraculous power that the lady had believed for and received. And when the woman saw that she was not hid, she came trembling and falling down before him. And she declared unto him before all the people for what cause she had touched him and how she was healed immediately. And he said unto her, Daughter, be of good comfort. Thy faith have made thee whole. Go in peace. And I think that passage there has been so real to me over the past four years. And... Um, identifying the lack of the power of Jesus in me and seeing that it's readily available, you know? Seeing that it's true power, it's virtue, and we receive it on our knees. I don't know about you, but that's where I get it, you know? I come into service, and Pastor Richard does an amazing job, and I'm convicted, I'm encouraged, but it's not until I go back and I get on my knees before the Lord that I experience that power and that touch and that virtue. And that's what changes the lives, you know. That's what helps put into practice what we learn. And it changes our look on, on life. It changes how we, uh, you know, how we approach things. The one thing that uh, really stood out to me in the story when I was reading some commentaries on it, the story already stood out to me, and I had already said, hey, it speaks to me about spiritual healing, not just about you know, physical healing, so I'm going to take it that way. And, um, and reading some commentaries of the past week as I was preparing what the Lord's had in my heart and praying for him, Father, how do I get out what, what's going on in here? How do I let people know how you've touched me, let them inside? And one of the things that, you know, I didn't even really know is that, you know, because of her, her issue of blood, you know, what she had, she was unable to participate in the religious life of the nation. She wasn't ab- actually able to praise and be a part the way the rest of the nation was because she was considered defiled. And so some of that burning in her was that she couldn't worship the Lord, you know. She couldn't do the same that everybody else could. And, you know, that convicted me so much. And some of the commentaries say that she was so motivated that she was almost superstitious knowing that Jesus could heal her. And I don't know about you, but I feel like I miss some of that superstition that used to be there, that when I was first born again, you'd believe anything, you know. 
you'd believe God could heal, God could touch, God can cast a demon out, and then you're born again, turn around 15 years, and it's just you're doing things that you just always did, but you still don't believe it the way you did that first, that first few months, you know. The power was so real. Someone could tell you that's not possible. Nothing was impossible, you know. So-and-so can't be saved. Your sister's lost. This can't happen. Nope. Nothing's impossible. The power of Jesus did it in me. He'll do it in anybody. And I think that's the biggest thing that's been made fresh in my heart. He can do anything, you know. Christianity has not changed. The same power that was in the Bible is still here today. I think that for myself, I got soft is what I call it, you know, when you let things go and you accept that times are different. Times are different, but that hasn't changed. You know, and that's the biggest thing that God's put in my heart is that I haven't changed. You have. You know, the power's still here. I'm still here. Come and get it if you want it. Come and touch me and receive the virtue. And uh, that's something I wasn't doing five to six years ago, and that's kind of what's gotten me and rekindled and things and the Lord touching me. You know, they talked about the lady with the issue of blood. One person described it as those. She was defiled, destitute, discouraged, and desperate. But she came to Jesus and her need was met. And that reminds me of that guy back at 14 years old, back in 1995, you know, I felt that. And uh, at a certain point, I didn't feel it, but I feel it now, you know. Jesus has convicted me. He's brought Shelly and I through some trials that we both look at each other today, and we're like, how are we here? How are we standing? You could have never told me we'd make it through what we made it, you know. But we did, you know. And it's the same divine power that was in, that that woman reached in and touched that's available to us every day. You know, another thing that stands out to me about the story that really convicts my heart is that, you know, I often ask myself, am I that desperate? Am I that destitute? But I also picture, you know, all the people walking around Jesus, and I realize what got me to that place where I lost sight of being destitute for that touch of his garment, for that power to be in my life to change others' lives. And it was that I was just another person walking around him. You know, I was in church. I was doing the same stuff I did before that God miraculously used and touched lives that saved other kids' lives, that encouraged them, that changed them. But I was just doing the same thing. The power wasn't there anymore. And how many times I look back and I'm like, man, a few weeks has gone by and I haven't touched Jesus. You know, I've spent time with him. I've listened to teaching, but it hasn't been the same thing. You know, and and that's why the power is not there, you know. And I was thinking about it last night. I was laying on the floor, and you always reflect when you're thinking about what God's done the past year. And just tears come into my eyes for missed opportunities to touch him, missed opportunities to get close to him, missed opportunities of the power that comes from that personal relationship with the Lord. You know, you can hear as much as you want, of the word being talked about, but the change doesn't come until, you, until you're down on your knees before him. And for me, I've learned that that power that comes from that relationship is what gives us the power over sin. It's what gives me the compassion for the loss. It's what gives me that word from the Lord when he says, hey, say something to your brother. You know, they might be hurting, and then you find out that you didn't know it, but they were, they were spiritually dying, and they come back, and you said, you know what, when you talked to me last week, thank you, that was God. I didn't know what to do. I was at my end. And that comes from that power. That comes from that personal relationship with them. And that's something from that time on when I was young. I I knew about it like I told you, but I lost it. I remember being 15, 16, young 20s and spending my prayer time praying for teenagers and adults. I pray that they, they find what I found. You know, I remember feeling compassion for them, saying this guy's been in church 12 years and he's never known God. You know, and it broke my heart. And I'd pray, Father, I pray that his eyes are open, that he knows you, you know. And because there's a total difference of someone that knows about them and someone that knows them. And when, once they do, there's so much joy. You go talk to someone, you know, I've had the opportunity of helping some of the younger. And you go speak to them after God's arrested their heart. And they know him now. It's so refreshing. You know, you're encouraged yourself when you're sitting there talking with them. 
because of stuff that you've said to them, now it's real to them, and they're saying it back to you, and they don't even know it, you know, and it's just on their face. They're lit up because of the power of God. And that's something that's so precious, something that I missed and that the Lord is just putting back in my heart, you know, and that I'm excited about. It's been a, it's been a lot of pain and anguish to get there, you know. There's been a lot of trials that I'd have to be honest and say I wish I didn't have to go through them. If I, I wish, you know, you look back on things, you say I wish I could change it, but I wouldn't change what God's done in my heart right now. I wish that I was smarter and that I had learned it myself, that I didn't have to go down the roads I did, that I didn't have to bring my wife down the roads with me, you know. But I don't, I don't want to change what I've learned. So at this point, what do you do, you know? You embrace it. You thank God for it. You know, I, I was telling Shelly, and sometimes I'm at the shop late working by myself, and you just start to weep, you know. The overwhelming love of the Lord comes over you, and you weep for what you went through when you didn't love him, but you weep because you know you didn't deserve it, and he still loves you, you know. You feel it even more now. You taste of it even more, and you know that you don't deserve it. Because what happened is there comes time when you forget, and you, re- you, you, you don't say it because that would be offensive, but you feel like you deserve it, you know. And you feel like God's love's always going to be there, but we don't deserve it. However, it's there in full abundance all the time. And that's something that it's not a few weeks go by that I don't break down in tears. So thankful for the love and grace of Jesus that I don't deserve. And most of all, so thankful that even after despising it, Father's grace allows me to still reach out and touch that virtue. He still allows me to come get on my knees and be touched by him. When there was a time I didn't think it was going to happen again. You know? Because when you're, when you're not doing it, you're just doing what you used to do. There comes in a bitterness and a discontent, and that's what came in my heart, you know. I, um, I've totally lost my place in my notes, so I might have to dig back around. But um, who needs notes, right, when you're just sharing what the Lord's doing in your heart? And I remember doing the right things, and uh, the bitterness and the discontent settling in. I remember still laying my life down and helping younger people, but I wasn't reaching in and tapping that power that's available to us. And I remember just getting fed up, you know. And I remember feeling that I told Shelly one time, you know, once it was just getting evident, she knew I was struggling with things and that, you know, it wasn't going great. And um, so the words that just started to come out of my mouth, you know, that attitude. And I remember telling her, I've laid my life down. I've stood in the gap for these younger people. And no one's been here to do it for me. And it was bad enough that I was willing to vocalize that. You know how it is sometimes when a thought comes in, you cast it down, and you're like, Father, forgive me. But it was at a place that, that that bitterness, discontent was there. But I would vocalize it. I said, I'm out here doing everything I can to save everyone else and to do what I can to be in the gap for them, to bring them the word. Not one of them's here for me. You know, and uh, she always gave me the word, but... I, I wasn't having it, you know, I wasn't listening to it. And it wasn't long that uh, my heart was so bitter it was numb, you know. I couldn't feel love. At that time, I, to- I told her, I said, I don't really know what love is. I said, to be honest, if you ask me, I couldn't tell you. And I meant it, you know. My, I was in a place, she'd look at me and, she'd, you know, she'd look me in the eyes and say, you're different, you know. And I was. I couldn't feel anything, you know. I didn't let the Lord come in and heal me, and I just let the bitterness just grow. Just grow. I took a step back. I stopped doing what I was doing, helping out. I knew that there was no point there. My heart wasn't in it right then. And I, but I didn't, I didn't fall on the rock. I, I was upset with the Lord. Why haven't you loved me? Why well, haven't loving all these other people? And I didn't know his love because I hadn't been on my knees and encountered the power of the living God. You know, I had been doing the actions, but I hadn't received the virtue. All my virtue was gone. What the Lord had filled up, and I wasn't refilling, and I had nothing to give to these people, and I was just bone dry. And that bitterness took over my heart and my life and took me down a spiral that's shameful to think about and mention, but uh, 
you know, as I was praying about it, I, I don't enjoy talking about this stuff. I'm kind of a private person. I'd rather keep it to myself. But I feel like uh, at this point, it's robbing God of his glory if I don't talk about what he's done for me, where he's brought me. Um, that, that bitterness took over so much, I, I couldn't, got to the point I couldn't see the, the love from my own family. My dad would come over and, you know, with my mom, he'd weep for me try to talk to me, and I'd just look him in the eye. And, just, and there was no emotion, no feeling. I don't, I don't need it. They'd say, you know, Dad, back Junior, you're messing your life up. You're going to go to hell. I don't care. I remember my wife telling me, you know, you're going to die the way you're living. And I said, it doesn't bother me. And then for the one time in my life, it didn't scare me, the thought of dying. And I knew that I wasn't right, but I was so bitter. I was so numb. I couldn't feel anything. There was so much hatred in my heart, it didn't matter to me. It didn't matter, you know. But for some reason, God's grace is sufficient. And none of those people left me, you know. They stood through me with what I like to call being a monster, you know. There was nothing to love at that point, you know. There was nothing, that was pure faith that the Lord was going to deliver me. Because it wasn't any love reciprocated, it wasn't any love there, and they knew it. But they also knew what God had done back 20 years ago, back in 1995. They had seen the change. They knew that God's able. And they continued to stand in the gap. And Father, you know, he... He has his way of crushing us ever so slowly. Um, I feel more like it was a slow grinding crush that lasted for a long time. It wasn't quick, you know. You almost cry for the hammer to just crush in pieces right away. But Father's gracious, and I think part of the reason he doesn't do that is if he does it so quick, you can't experience his love at the same time. It's a very supernatural thing to be stripped of everything you have and just being crushed slowly, but know that God loves you. And I knew it. Almost lost my family. Almost lost everything I had, you know. But those things don't matter at the time when Father's dealing with you. You look back now and you, you're like, how did we get here? How did we make it? You sit down with Pastor Richard, you know, once a month for meeting and updating and current wild stories with Paul and uh, you know he looks at you and smiles and loves you and you know you even go back and you're like man why does this guy like me so much you know and I think he has to because he's a pastor so I'm pretty sure he does that for everyone here but um, that's super, I just experienced the supernatural love of Jesus you know and it was it wasn't easy you know you know you don't deserve it and that that fire and feeling didn't come back quickly. Like I said, it was a long three to four year just crushing. And I mean, every time you thought something was going to go right, it didn't. You know, every time you thought the tide's turning, it didn't. You know, and it was almost one of those things, you know, where I felt like the Lord was looking at me, what are you going to do now? You know, and it was in my own heart. I, I just had to come to the place of, Lord, I'll serve you whether you take my family, whether you take everything I got, I'll serve you. I don't want it that way, you know, but I'll serve you because you've been more than merciful with me. You've been gracious with me, and you loved me when I was unlovable, you know. There's times when we feel lovable, but going through some of the things I went through, I knew I was unlovable. I almost detest myself at times, some of the stuff that would come out of my mouth and I would say and what was in my heart. But Father wasn't done with me. I remember at one point, I was almost like, you know, the Lord wouldn't leave me alone. I was in that bitterness. And he would just still just come around and just poke me in the chest, you know. Or he'd have Shelley give some sassy biblical comment that still bothered, you know, that offends you, but you knew deep down it's the word of God. You can deny whatever you want, you know it's true. You can walk out of here. You can have as many drinks as you want. You're still going to remember what she said is true, and it's not going to change a thing. And I was almost on a mission to, to prove them wrong. I remember thinking I got to the point was like, I, I'm, going to, I'm going to make sure that I die. I'm going to kill myself being stupid, you know? And I wanted to prove, and he would not let me go. 
would not. I tried so many things, and Father would not let me go. I remember being picked up in a parking lot by my dad and my mom. And I shouldn't even have been alive at that point. I was on the bench that night. I was drinking. I don't even know how much I had. I had way too much. You know, I threw a bunch of pills in my mouth, and I said, this is it. I'm tired of fighting the struggle. I'm done. And what happens? Shelly called my dad. My dad shows up in the parking lot and found me. <clears throat> Drives me home, you know. Some of the most embarrassing memories I can think of. But it just shows how much God loves us, you know. Sitting in that truck, Dad hops out. He says, what are you doing? Didn't even have an answer for him. You know, didn't know why I was standing there. He says, you know, and what does he do? He shares the love of Jesus with me on the ride home. You know, I could not escape it. I couldn't get away from it. The Lord loves us way too much to let us go that easy, you know. And a lot of times we think life's hard, and we go through trials that are truly hard. I'm not knocking trials because I've been through them the last four years, and people say they're going through something. I used to think, yeah, yeah, everything's a trial. Now I think, let me pray for them. You know, the trials are real. It doesn't matter how big and small to someone else. They're big enough to strip us down to our core, to where we need him. And I just remember sitting there thinking, Lord, you must love me. If you won't let this go, you must love me. And so it was a, it was a while of rebuilding. And a lot of you guys have known me. And we've been here three years now. And some of you have known me before that. And uh, part of what the Lord's been doing in my heart is I've kind of been on the back burner once I got in here. A lot of you guys know me as a pretty loud, stubborn kind of guy. And... Uh, talkative, and I've just been on the back, on the outside, the fringes. And the past few months, the Lord's just said, all right, that's long enough. I've let you sit out there, sit on the sideline with your pouty lip, and it's time to be a part of what God's doing. And that's a part of Westgate. And so for me, it was just what's been on my heart the last few months is I've just wanted to raise my hands on a Sunday night when we're talking and just share what the Lord's done. And just share that Father has been speaking to me that, okay, Paul, it's time to be all in at Westgate. You know, because we can all go to church and we can be a part and we can share a little bit of what the Lord's doing. But it's one thing to just jump in and say, Lord, whatever you got here, I'm here. I know the Lord brought me here. He brought my family here. He preserved us. And uh, I'm here. I'm all in. This is uh, what you saw this morning is, is me. I'm excited about what the Lord's doing. He's stirring in my heart and getting on my knees, being touched by him. I'm excited about what the Lord's doing at Westgate. I don't know about you guys, but ever since we did the harvest party, praise and worship's just been a little different, you know. It's just been a little bit more powerful, you know. I walk in, I feel the presence of the Lord here. And I'm excited about what he's doing. One of the things that, you know, was on my heart is just a, a lot of times when you think about that visit, visitation and that, that virtue going out, you just think that that's Pastor Richard's job. You know, he's got to spend his time on his knees and get before the Lord to bring us the word that we need to hear. And Father's just been on my heart nonstop and said, no, he's doing his part. Your responsibility is to get on your knees and touch Jesus. Receive the virtue that's available today and come in ready. How powerful would it be if all of us came in after touching the Lord? That's where the power comes. That's where when the visitor walks in the back room, they just feel it hit them like that. Something's different about this place. It's not just the teaching. It's the power in the, in the people. It's in the bodies. And Father doesn't touch us just for us. He touches me to touch each one of you. Not because we're anything special, but because that's how he works. We receive the virtue and the power and he uses it to touch other lives. He uses it to encourage other people and to speak to one another. And I think as I'm just talking, and that's pretty much what I had, that's just my encouragement, because that's what the Lord's been stirring up in me, is just all of us just to receive the virtue of the Lord, and that not to settle for, we're living in a different day, and it's not there. It's there. The same power that was there in the revivals when people were getting healed, when devils were getting cast out, it's available today, and it's available to us every day. And let's walk in it, and let's live it. Thank you, guys.